who's going to get a chance to talk just a little bit about conducting. And I thought, well, where best to start than to look at a conductor who has said something about conducting. Do you know um, Leonard Slatkin's book, Conducting Business? Uh, actually, I have read it. I know the book. Okay, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's one of my favorites because he just tells all kinds of dirt about conductors. Oh, awesome. um, but he's, his first chapter, he starts out by saying, conducting is a truly mysterious art and job. You work alone, but also with more than 100 people. Most of the time, you turn your back to the people you are supposed to be entertaining. You are consumed by a feeling of power and simultaneous helplessness. Talent cannot be measured until you gain experience. The pro profession is fraught with peril. Why go into it? So my question to you is, why go into it? Wow, that's a, that's a great statement. I, I really want to, uh, now you've got I'll, the, I'll uh, text it to you. Yeah, I love it. Well, it is, uh, first and foremost, there is nothing quite like being inside the sound of great symphonic music. And when we have an audience around us, if we have great acoustic and everybody's up close, they get to experience that uh, as well. On the podium, not only do I have this experience of uh, music, but I have the opportunity, uh, the responsibility to study the score, to know every note, to know every phrase, but not only that, to understand the composer, the time of the composer, and what it means to be a living during those time periods, how it affects how it affected people then when it was written, and how the music still to this day carries on a piece of art unto itself, constantly changing us, constantly inspiring us. So uh, I'd say first of all, as a conductor, the, the greatest aspect is that um, surrounding of oneself with the beauty and the art of great symphonic music, but also it's the communicating. We all love to communicate with people, and usually we do it with words, but as a conductor, there's so much that you can say in a, such a personal way, through your eyes, through your hands, to the musicians that you're with, um, sharing something very special, sharing very deep moments, sometimes giving and taking at the same time, listening to each other. And I think that's the joy of every musician on stage, that they're constantly, um, spontaneously responding to each other. And then, for a conductor, that idea, which is so important, of uh, feeling the warmth of the audience, feeling the, the aspect of the audience actually giving shape to the experience itself. When I'm conducting the orchestra, I'm aware that every time I turn to the cello, I'm in a sense highlighting for all of my audience that this is a moment to listen for. This is something to highlight. As I raise my fist to the trumpet players in the back, there is this expectation from all of you to maybe, you know, hide your ears a little bit or to stand up and be ready for something exciting. So there is a sharing physically, not only with the orchestra, but with the audience. You, uh, you mentioned the physical aspect of it and turning and so forth. Is there, is there a conductor, uh, two questions. One is, is there a conductor who was a, a, an important mentor to you in particular? And is there a conductor who is a, someone that you would attempt in some ways to sort of model yourself after in terms of, in terms of technique or whatever, whatever, in whatever way you might want to model, model yourself? Well, I'll tell you, for all of us, all of us who are musicians, all of us who are conductors, I think we are constantly evolving, always listening, changing, watching. I still, every moment, am uh, finding myself inspired by some conductor doing some interpretation somewhere. Um, and I still, myself, uh, find myself surprised again and again by uh, the ways that uh, music can be interpreted differently in the hands and in the minds of different people. For me, personally, my first in inspiration with, was with a con uh, conductor named Carlos Kleiber. Carlos Kleiber, for me, was someone that shared every part of himself with the musicians and with great joy on his face. And it was in this smile on his face, in this in this um, sense that even when he twitched his ear, that the musicians knew what what that meant in a musical way was an inspiration for me. And he had beautiful technique, 
very, very clear, very beautiful hands. Uh, and then another inspiration, even to this day, um, I love to watch uh, videos of, of Claudio Alvaro. For me, uh, again, he's a conductor who you feel in his entire being um, a very spontaneous interpretation, something that came very deeply from within him and in a very musical way, always. So I, I, I'm inspired by a lot of people, but those are two favorites. Yeah, I, um, I teach um, orchestral music to um, a bunch of scientists at Caltech, and one of the things when I'm talking about ensemble playing, one of my favorite videos to use is Carlos Fiber conducting the uh, Vienna Philharmonic at the New Year's concert doing um, the beautiful Blue Danube, and there is such incredible subtlety, um, and the orchestra, of course, has been playing it every New Year's for for 150 years, 160 years, but you're right. He twitches his ear, or he, you know, turns his head this way, and you can hear things, things happen. And uh, Abato is another one. It's just an amazing mind. I remember uh, seeing Abato conduct Buzek from memory one time, and to me, that's just a feat that's just incredible. Me as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, before I let you go, because I, I didn't promise the uh, New West Symphony Board that I would only keep you for a few minutes, but I do have one more question for you. Speaking of uh, conductors and mentors and all of that. Have you ever had an experience where you were called at the last minute to conduct something, a la Leonard Bernstein replacing, uh, who was it Leonard Bernstein replaced on a snowy night? Who was that? I can't remember now. He made his premiere in New York because somebody's in a snowbank somewhere. I have only replaced conductors at last minute for rehearsals, but I've never had, you know, when I first started, uh, in the Vancouver Symphony, I was the assistant conductor there and the cover conductor for every single program. And it's a terrifying thing to be a cover conductor or an assistant conductor in, uh, in an orchestra because, first of all, we really don't know what we're doing yet. We are just starting out our career. There's so much repertoire to learn. Uh, each week, we're trying to, uh, if you can imagine, I mean, you're really trying to integrate into your mind, all of these notes and all of this depth of understanding. Um, and each week you are prepared in case something happens. Uh, so uh, I, I always, it was one of those things where I wanted, I didn't really want anybody to not show up, but there was a part of me that hoped for the excitement and the opportunity. Well, it may still happen. That's, uh, that's true. It's well, listen, I'm going to let you go, but thank you so much for the time. Appreciate it. Looking forward to the concert. I'm looking forward to spending time with all of you. Thank you so much. Kirshen was born into a middle-class Jewish family of Russian and Ukrainian origin, and his father, who was born Moisha Gershowitz, uh, came to the United States and worked as a... Uh, worked as a foreman in a woman's factory, a shoe factory. Copeland's father was also of uh, middle class origins uh, from Lithuania. His father's name was Harris Morris Copeland, and he owned a store uh, below, above which the family lived, and Copeland described it as a kind of a neighborhood Macy's. Gershwin and Copeland were both well situated then to create this kind of new musical vernacular because they were so much a part of the New York scene right around the turn of the century with all of the melting pot ideas that you would associate with New York, jazz, vaudeville, klezmer, popular dance music, you name it. As a young man, Copeland studied with a couple of local teachers, but by around the time he was 20, he decided that it was time to move to Paris, and he studied in Paris for a time, he arrived in, a, in a Fontainebleau, which had a school for American composers, and studied with Paul Vidal and Isidore Philippe. But then he was he attracted the attention of Nadia Boulanger. Now, Nadia Boulanger was one of the most formidable pedagogues and composers that France ever produced. And she began to teach Copeland. And she told him that he needed to stop trying to imitate European masters and discover his own distinct American sound. And she also taught him something about musical economy. And she said something like, just use as many notes as you absolutely need, no more, and make sure that those notes really, really count. Well, he started writing music that 
would make sense to Copeland in the 20s and the early 30s in Paris, because that was where Stravinsky was, and Eric Satie, and Francis Poulenc was going to be there. And these were composers to one degree or another kind of associated with the modernist movement, or what we might call the avant-garde. And Copeland began to write music, which we would certainly call avant-garde. He was noticed by Serge Kusevitsky, who was one of the great patrons of the arts in the early part of the century, and commissioned some music from Copeland. And to give you a, some context of the style of Copeland's later music, I want to play for you a piece that he wrote when he, around the time he came back to the United States from being in Paris. This is a piece called Piano Variations. Well, this is a great piece, and I commend it to you. It's really, really a, a wonderful piece of music, but you have to admit that it's not a piece that necessarily you would fall in love with at first sight. Um, so Copeland was riding high on the wave of the American avant-garde, and then the Depression happened. And Copeland instinctively realized that the kind of harsh, challenging sounds of pieces like the piano variations were not necessarily what the American public needed at that point. And in addition to that, he was becoming more and more socially and politically conscious and active. And this, this led him to want to create music that was more accessible to what we would call the masses, or what were called the masses at the time. And this kind of activism and, and social consciousness got him into trouble in the 1950s during the McCarthy era. In any case, Copeland decided that he sort of needed, needed a, 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 re, a restart of his style. So he traveled to Mexico with a fellow composer and friend named Carlos Chavez. And when Mexico, when in Mexico, Copeland heard a lot of folk music. And he began to think that folk music might be the answer to his problem and that he might be able to incorporate folk music. He came back and he wrote El Salon Mexico in 1936, which uses Mexican folk music very, very effectively. And then he was commissioned to write music for a ballet about the life of the famous gunslinger William Bonney, the score we know as Billy the Kid, and Rodeo followed that, and then eventually uh, uh, Appalachian Spring in 1944-1945. In and it was in those pieces, really, that Copeland established what has come to be known as the American sound in classical music. Well, this distinctively American sound from the, comes from the blending of several different elements. And the first of these is a kind of a folksy, dance-like tune that we associate with Billy the Kid and Rodeo and things Western. see a lot of smiles. Copeland was once asked how a kid from Brooklyn could write music like this, and he remarked that every kid in Brooklyn grew up watching movies with cowboys and Indians and, and seeing, you know, cowboy uh, films, later on cowboy shows on television and, and hearing music on the radio, so it came very naturally to him. There's another facet to Copeland's music that appears pretty early on, but it and it is also very evident in El Salon, Mexico. And this is where he takes folk music and music that is inspired by folk music and, and puts it through the, the lens of modernism in the way that the piano variations are modern, particularly rhythmic modernism. Very often in Copeland, you hear melodies and harmonies that are very accessible and very, very easy to understand. But the rhythm has a certain complexity to it. Here's an example. Well, 
this music is folksy, yes, but it's simple, no. It's very accessible in terms of the harmony and in terms of the melody, but if you try tapping your foot to that music, you will soon, soon discover that either you fail, or B, your feet are not tapping in any kind of a regular pace. Try it. So it's very rhythmically complex in the way that Stravinsky's music was very, very rhythmically complex. One last distinctive Copeland trick, and this one comes from the score to Billy the Kid. And in it, Copeland paints a musical picture of the wide open prairie. As a matter of fact, this music has come to be known as the open prairie sound. And in it, Copeland uses a, a approach to harmony in which he builds harmonies up in fourths and fifths rather than thirds, normal triad, dee, 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 that kind of a sonority you don't get so often in the open prairie sound. And it gives the music a kind of a spaciousness about it. Well, Appalachian Spring was composed on a commission from Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge, one of the great patrons of the arts in American history. Coolidge was a great supporter of the American choreographer and dancer Martha Graham, and it was Coolidge's idea to put Copeland and Martha Graham together. And the work was premiered in October of 1944 in the Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge Auditorium at the Library of Congress. Originally, Copeland called the work ballet for Martha. It was, but it was Graham who renamed it Appalachian Spring, ostensibly after a poem by Hart Crane. In reality, the work has little to do with Appalachia and not much to do with the spring either. Copeland also uh, always chuckled when people told him how much the work evoked the idea of spring and Appalachia because the score was completely finished before it ever got its name. It opens with a typical Copeland-esque figure um, this spacious atmosphere, kind of the open prairie sound that I mentioned. What happened to Mike? Do we know? Hello. Ah, thank you. Good, thank you very much. A little later, we hear the folk, the folk style of Copeland. A little later, the Stravinsky-esque rhythmic quality. Simple gifts. A shaker tune that Copeland adapted for the ballet. And this is footage from a, uh, a, a film version of Appalachian Spring danced by Martha Graham. It's a wonderful work, it comes to a beautiful conclusion. The concert ends with the suite from Bizet's Carmen, which has a rousing finale. I know that you're going to enjoy it. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the concert tonight.